I'm going to talk about. Can you hear me? Yeah. Bring this closer. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And thanks, Alison, for the introduction. I got caught up with the timer. Um, I'm going to talk about now or. The UK became known as Turf Island, how it became uh, seen as one of the most um, vociferous, if you like, and loud centres of activism against gender identity ideology around. And I think there, there are a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons for that is because unlike in other countries where um, governments have introduced self-ID, for example, of gender identity ideology, they've, they've done it under the radar in Ireland, that's what happened. It was snuck in on the back of uh, same-sex marriage law. Nobody hardly in the country knew it was happening. Um, and it, they, they didn't know, the, you know, they only found out later when it was already uh, law. Whereas in this country, both in England and Wales and um, also in Scotland, there were public consultations on the introduction of self-ID. And I think that was crucial in terms of our ability to stop it, which we did in the end. Um, there's no self-ID in either country, at least in law. There is in practice, but there isn't in law. So I think that was one of the key reasons why we were able to um, be as active as we were. There was During the consultations, there was hope of stopping it. And so a lot of women got involved in that. And I think another reason as well are the, is some of the cases, particularly Mayor's case, because it means we can speak. And um, in many countries, it's much more difficult for women to speak because of the, of the legislation in those countries, particularly some of the hate crime legislation that's in existence now. So the combination of the government's introducing or trying to introduce self-ID in a public way, and then later the, the case law, which said that uh, gender critical beliefs, the, the belief that uh, sex is real and immutable and is important, or protected beliefs, both of those are really helpful in terms of the development of activism in this country and our ability to speak out. In 2016, the House of Commons uh, Women and Equalities Committee, ironically, made a proposal for introducing self-ID so that anyone could just, by filling in a form, um, change their legal sex markers. And then there was a public consultation about those proposals that ended in October 2018. In Scotland, the government wanted to introduce similar legislation, and they also had a public consultation, uh, which ran from November 2017 to March 2018. It was a much shorter consultation period. During both those consultation periods, women, once they picked up what was going to happen, or what was being proposed to happen, started to organise. There had been um, feminist activism against gender identity ideology before that. There was a conference in, I think, um, 2012 called Thinking Differently. Some of the organisers are here, so if I'm wrong about the date, you can correct me. Was it, 20, was it 2016? And there were organisations already in existence like Transgender Trends who campaign against the transitioning of children. But during the consultations, women's groups working against, and some lesbian and gay groups as well, working against, uh, trying, or working to oppose the um, self-ID proposal sprang up everywhere and started organising public meetings. And I think it was that, it was that point that Turf Island was born, okay. or started anyway. Once we started organising public meetings, um, I call them pro-trans activists, uh, or no, maybe gender identity activists might be better, gender identity activists started to try to close them down. They harassed venues, they phoned venues up, they said that we were hate groups, Quite some venues did cancel meetings. Um, and there's a quote here from Janice Turner, who was a journalist at the time. She attended uh, some of the meetings and she said in an article about them, the changes to the very definition of man and woman are being proposed, yet it's impossible to hold a public meeting to discuss them. At, at that point in time, it was impossible to have a public meeting without um, gender identity activists turning up to try and stop the meeting taking place. They harassed women going in, they threatened women, and on a, at least one occasion, a woman was physically assaulted. Um, and around about that time, women were sacked from their jobs as well if they spoke out um, against the self-ID proposals or challenged gender identity ideology. Um, 
The mantra that was used by the activists at the time, which was a mantra which Stonewall introduced, was no debate. We, you know, uh, trans women are women, no debate. Um, and that's what they tried to enforce, basically, by trying to shut uh, the meetings down, but it didn't work. And I, I think that they did what they did, and particularly when uh, Marie McLaughlin was sorted and uh, waiting to go into a meeting by a group of men claiming to be women, one of whom was identified and he was convicted of assault by beating. After that, I think women became even more determined. And the more they tried to shut us down, the more determined we were to carry on speaking, to carry on having the meetings. And a lot of activism took off around that time. Women uh, worked and strategized often in closed Facebook meetings. Um, leafleted about the consultation on the streets, tried to get the word out about it. I think we realised very early on that the more people we could inform about the proposals, um, the better a chance we'd have of stopping them because most people would disagree with them. And I think we were right about that. I participated in some of that leafleting, which was organised by Fair Play for Women. I would say about 99% of the people that I spoke to when I was leafleting and all the other women leafleting said the same, agreed with us. And they were shocked at the idea, many of them, that somebody could just fill in a form and change their legal sex marker. Um, women were posted on social media. I never used social media until this time. I didn't like the idea of Twitter or Facebook. It was during that period that I started using it. And I think that was true of quite a lot of women. So articles, I think it's very important that women campaigned within all the main political parties, often against a lot of opposition, it's very difficult. And they also liaised with each other across political parties. So women in the Labour Party, in the Conservative Party, in the Lib Dems and the Greens, were not only um, pushing for their own parties to change their um, policy, but they were also communicating with each other and liaising with each other about what was happening. Women lobbied MPs. There were some sympathetic MPs, not, not many. There were more in the Conservative Party. There were some sympathetic uh, women MPs in the Labour Party. It was very difficult for them to speak out. Some eventually did. And they also lobbied uh, members of the House of Lords as well. It's easier for that to appear, although not many of them did speak out, but it's easier for them because they, um, they don't rely on votes. And also made links with sympathetic journalists. And there were some in some, in some publications who did write a lot of articles during that time. Janice Turner was one of them. Um, Fair Play for Women put adverts in the in the paper they certainly put one in the evening standard which is a london-based paper at that time explaining to people about the proposals and in scotland for women scotland and i think lgb alliance jointly um put an advert in as well it's one of the national scottish newspapers at least one maybe more than one so all of a lot of activism was based on trying to get the word out and tell people what was going on so eventually in England and Wales, the government announced they were not going to introduce self-ID. Um, it wasn't directly because of the results of the consultation. It never became completely clear exactly what the results of the consultation had been. Um, but they realised, I think, that there was a lot of opposition. And they began to realise this is not as straightforward as they thought. It wasn't a simple civil rights issue, giving civil rights to you know, an oppressed minority which was the idea that some people had about it. So they said they were going, were not going to introduce it. In Scotland, the government wanted to go ahead and they did introduce a bill to introduce self-ID in Scotland um, and amend the Gender Recognition Act in Scotland, which technically they can do, because it's the, 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 but they cannot amend the Equality Act in Scotland because it's UK-wide and it's not devolved to Scotland. So the UK government had the power to stop the Scottish government from introducing the self-ID legislation. And they did that on the basis that it would have an adverse effect on equality law throughout the UK. Um, the Scottish government challenged that, but they didn't succeed in the court. So basically the UK government prevented the Scottish government from introducing self-ID, so it didn't happen there either. So we diverted self-ID in both jurisdictions eventually after a lot of campaigning. During the campaign against self-ID, a lot of women started to realise that although self-ID didn't exist in law, 
it existed in practice mm. all across the country in public institutions and in private corporations as well. Um, and I think many of us hadn't realized how deeply embedded it had become throughout the country and, until that time. It was in health, education, the criminal justice system, sport, civil service, everywhere. But as a result, largely of lobbying by um, gender identity ideology lobbyists, particularly Stonewall, and I think gendered intelligence were very influential as well. Um, it was introduced behind the scenes. That is the playbook that the in, internationally that lobby uses. They try to introduce things un, unbeknownst to the public without public consultation, uh, because they know that if they, in most places, if they try to introduce self ID and it becomes clear to people what it is, there'll be opposition to it. So they try to avoid that by going under the radar, which is what happened in Ireland. Um, and they had succeeded in introducing basically what were self-ID policies right across the board, which many of us hadn't realised until that point. So the campaigns that had been started to pose self-ID then switched to challenging the de facto self-ID that existed across the board in, in many different institutions. And some of them focused on specific areas like prisons, like, um, keep prison single sex um, was very uh, prominent in working against um, the, the placement of male offenders in women's prisons. And they had some successes, but not complete success. And now other, other groups have taken that up as well. I think Sex Matters have done work around it and uh, the Women's Rights Network also. Trans, uh, gender Trend has done quite a lot of work on education. They continued that. Safe Schools Alliance started doing work on education and changing what was happening um, in practice in education. Uh, and Transgender Trend also have been working against the transition of children for some time. And then there are other campaigns that uh, focus on a lot of different areas rather than specialising in one. So many of the groups that have been set up during the self-ID uh, consultations carried on working, not all of them, but most of them did. And also new groups got established as well. Just to you know, the, spreading the word, getting the word out about what's going on is one of the key things in challenging it. Um, the women involved in the Scottish campaigns have produced a book called The Women Who Wouldn't Wished, which, which, which talks about the campaigns that they were involved in and what they did. And then WDI uh, internationally has produced a, what is an international book from uh, people in different, women in different parts of the world, but it originated in, with WDI UK, which is why I'm including it here. Um, but with, it's, it looks at the UK, but it also looks at uh, what's happening internationally. We'd managed to avert self-ID. We then started working on the uh, self-ID in practice that was going on. And I think we've had a lot of success and gradually more and more it's it has become more possible to talk in public and more uh, more, me more of the media are taking up the issue. Uh, it's become easier to some degree in the political parties to take it up. And I think that the, what really illustrates the change is that um, women's sex based rights became an issue and publicly became an issue in the recent election. Um, Party for Women had candidates in some um, areas, but as well as that, I think particularly the, the, the leading political parties, the main political parties, had started to realise by this point that they couldn't keep on ignoring women. They couldn't keep on ignoring um, our advocacy for sex-based rights. So this is from the Conservative Party's election manifesto. If they'd done this five years ago, it'd be brilliant. They, the manifesto was published just before the election. They'd been in power for 14 years hadn't done any of it, but I think it illustrates how much they have been influenced by um, both women in their own party, particularly women like Kenny Badenoch, who have been pushing for sex-based rights for some time, and also by the different organisations that have been advocating for sex-based rights, who have been lobbying the different political parties. So uh, they said they would complete the impl implementation of the Council Review, um, that is going to happen because the Labour Party are going to do it. They're banning pu puberty blockers. The Labour Party have now committed to doing that. And also the private prescription of puberty blockers. Um, they said that they would amend the NHS constitution so that it recognises every patient's right to request single-sex accommodation and same-sex intimate care. Um, 
they said they won't allow the word woman to be raised within the health service and uh, they, they wouldn't allow terms like chest feeding and birthing parents and that they would introduce primary legislation to clarify the protected characteristic of sex and the Equality Act means biological sex, which is the resource of campaigning and particularly campaigning via sex matters. And they said um, they'd only allow an individual to have one sex in the eyes of the law. I presume they're talking about non-binary. I'm not really quite sure what they mean by that. Or maybe they, they say they won't recognise gender fluid. Now, if they'd done all this five years ago or even two years ago, it would have been brilliant. They haven't done any of it, really, except for the cast review and the puberty blockers about which they have done. But the fact that that was in there illustrates how much success we've had, I think. And the Labour Party's manifesto said that they, will, they would work to implement the cash flow. They didn't say how, but they are now doing what the Tories said that they would do. Um, they said Labour is part of our Equality Act and they'll continue to support the implementation of its single sex exceptions, which allow for men to be uh, excluded from women's only spaces, including men who claim a gender identity, uh, and including those who have a GRC. The thing is, though, that it's not quite clear based on the things that the some Labour politicians said in the lead up to the election, what they mean by single sex services and whether they mean that, that men with a GRC will be included. Um, that remains to be seen. They said they would modernise the Gender Recognition Act. What that they're proposing is that they will change the act so that instead of having two doctors uh, have to give a, a diagnosis of gender dysphoria to get a certificate, it will be one doctor. And instead of having a requirement to live in the other gender for two years, there will be a two year reflection period. Getting a, a recommendation from one doctor is going to, it's going to, everyone's going to be able to do that. So if that is, that is almost self ID if they do introduce that. In the um, to the speech this week, they did include um, a draft conversion therapy bill, but they didn't mention the Gender Recognition Act. So if they are intending to do this, they obviously aren't intending to do it for a while. It's possible they may be kicking it into the long grass. I don't know. It's not clear yet. Um, but it's a big shift for the Labour Party to have even talked about the implementation of single sex um, exemptions there. These are just some of the upcoming challenges, the, the draft conversion practices bill, which I've already mentioned, um, potential amendments to the Gender Recognition Act, and then for, it remains to be seen what they mean by single sex provisions. We may have to fight them if they say that they include men with the GRC. Thank you.